Patricia Del Giorno is one of our favorite speakers. We are really lucky to have her here on the east end of Long Island and to have her uh, subject of interest be of great interest to us too. She has spoken here before about women spies in World War II and nurses in World War II. As you know, the reason we're here today is that she's going to be speaking about women journalists in World War II. Well, in May, she will follow up with part two, and that will be during the Vietnam War, people who reported from Vietnam, women. In June, we haven't really figured out the dates yet, but that's why you have to look at your newsletters. In June, possibly at the end of June, she will come back and talk about well, part three, which will be Bosnia and the Middle East. All very worthwhile programs. Then we'll probably skip a couple of months and wait, and sometime in August or September, we'll have her back to talk about Rosie the Riveter. And I know you'll all be here for that. So, Pat has made, as, as is probably obvious, she's made an extensive study of women's role, roles in World War II, and has participated in World War II summer studies at Cambridge and Oxford Universities. In 2013, she completed a master's thesis entitled Women Secret Agents in World War II. This has launched her into fame here. She lectures and gives presentations on secret agents. Oh, women aviators. I think she did that. Rosie the Riveter, nurses at World War II, and we're just uh, scratching the surface here. Please welcome Patricia Del Giorno. Thank you very much, Pemmy. And thank you all for coming. Um, can you all hear me? In the back there? Okay. So, no job for a woman. What's a woman doing here? These were just a couple of the insults. Well, I'll leave that one. These were just a couple of the insults that were hurled at women uh, in World War II uh, when they tried to report. Uh, at the outset of the war, women reporters were restricted to the society desk. They only reported on weddings, on charity luncheons, on what they would call women's issues. And, uh, but with the onset of World War II, that changed all of that. The women, just as much as the men, this was the, the you know, the, the event of the, of the time. Everybody, every reporter wanted to get in and cover that story. And uh, at first they were met with, you know, just flat out no. And then the, uh, the government did agree to accredit them, but they couldn't be accredited to combat songs. The furthest they could go, they were permitted to go, was to uh, the field hospitals where the nurses treated patients, and they weren't permitted to go any further. Well, they were, and they were barred from press briefings, they were not given any transportation, but despite the ban, a number of very resourceful women managed to find their way to where the action was. And we're going to talk today about uh, several women, a number of women, photojournalists and print journalists who did fight their way into being able to report on what was happening with the war. And the first of our pioneering women is Martha Gellhorn. I, I'm sure that most of you know who Martha Gellhorn is. Yes? No? Okay. <laughs> I will say <clears throat> she was married to Ernest Hemingway. You all know who Ernest Hemingway was. Okay. But she was a writer, in her own writer, a fantastic writer. Anyway, she, uh, in, in a century that was really defined by war, Martha Gellhorn found her calling. She said, I never really found my own private disorderly place in the world, except in the general chaos of war. She grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, the child of intellectual and activist parents. In fact, 
uh, from a young age, she attended protest marches with her mother, who was an ardent activist for the suffrage movement. Her plan for life was to go everywhere, to see everything, and then to write about it. She made her name with a book called The Trouble I've Seen. That was about people beaten down by the Depression. Sharecroppers, mill workers, children and families really crushed by poverty. She was enraged by the suffering she saw and the failure of the government to do too much about it. Uh, one writer said that she had a gift for outrage. In 1936, a civil war was raging in Spain, and Martha was determined to cover it. With just a knapsack on her back and $50 tucked into her boot, she slipped over the border from France into Spain to work alongside her future husband, Ernest Hemingway. When she arrived in the spring of 1937, Madrid was in its fifth month of almost continuous bombardment by fascist forces. The Spanish Civil War was really the dress rehearsal for World War II. Martha wrote about what she saw all around her. Destroyed landscapes, burnt out buildings, the broken bodies of women, children, animals. She wrote about boys in pieces in makeshift hospitals. She wrote about children being stuffed onto trucks to be taken somewhere, anywhere, out of the horror with their mothers holding on to the tailgate and crying as their children were <clears throat> taken away. These, she said, these were the faces of war, and you can see some of them up there. She said, I was a great frequenter of hospitals, because that's where you see what war really costs. She was obsessed with getting things on the record. She said, I always thought if I could make anyone who had not seen such suffering begin to imagine that suffering, they would insist on a world without it. Now I'm going to show you a short film that's narrated by Marie Calder. She is a journalist many decades later who reported on the Middle East. But she, Martha Gellhorn was really her hero, and she's going to narrate this next clip. anybody who had a better writing style and I can't think of anybody who sympathized more with the people that she reported on. I think she was the best. The greatest war correspondent that ever lived, I think, bar none. Martha Gelborn wrote very fast, she said, because war happens to people one by one and I was always afraid that I would forget the exact sound, smell, words, gestures which were special to this moment and this place. This place is Belchite between Madrid and Barcelona. The Spanish Civil War twice swept through it and destroyed it. The villagers simply moved out and moved on, and Belchite remains today as it was when Martha Gellhorn wrote about it in 1937 as one of the most formative experiences of her life. 
war is traditionally a man's world. Martha Gellhorn intruded into it and captured some of the most graphic and moving moments in the literature of war. She told it like it was. She put it on the record. And on the record was one of her favorite phrases. If nobody puts it down on the record anywhere, then the monsters win totally. It must be someplace on the record, because otherwise they can get by with anything. Does it stop anything? I have no feeling that anything I've done has been of any use. But at least it is better than silence. Because if you're silent, then they can rewrite it any way they want. They can make it look great afterwards. So there is a point in the record. The way Martha Gellhorn thought and wrote about war colored my thinking and my career. When I pack my bags, among the necessities is a well-thumbed copy of Martha's book, The Face of War. Martha had seen the madness of war, but she always kept it simple and personal. War is nasty and brutal. It nearly cost me my sight and my hearing in a paddy field in Sri Lanka. It conjures images you'd rather forget. But these images, as Martha knew, are the strongest argument against war. Like me, Martha was American, and throughout her life, she delivered the telling snapshot. On the Blitz on Britain in 1940, classes go on all over England, teaching citizens how to act while being bombed. One particular class was being held in the home of a peeress, and the butler was very busy finding pencils for the ladies who had forgotten to bring theirs. <laughs> on the war in Vietnam. Our leaders tell us again and again that we are the richest and most powerful nation on earth. None of them tells us that we are the happiest. Madrid fell to the fascists on March 28, 1939. The civil war in Spain was over, but the fascist onslaught had just begun. Spain was where Italy tested out her troops, where Germany sent its Luftwaffe to bomb the civilian population of Guernica. It prefigured the horror of the war to come. Martha wasn't silent about the Civil War, and she wouldn't be silent about the wars that came after. At the outset of World War II, Martha Gellhorn and Ernest Hemingway, now they were married, they were living in Cuba. But Martha was on assignment to Collier's Magazine, and her long absences covering stories irritated Hemingway. Hemingway said he wanted a wife, not a competitor. During one of their separations, he cabled her. Are you a war correspondent? Or are you a wife in my bed? Well, she picked war correspondent. <laughs> she was tired of Hemingway's drunkenness and his bullying. And although Conyers Magazine had uh, agreed to credential Martha, Martha as their correspondent in the run-up to the Allied invasion of the continent, Normandy, vindictive Hemingway co-opted her spot. He went to him, he went to uh, Carter's and volunteered himself. Well, now he was world famous. So they picked him. <laughs> and he could have been a, anywhere, any news agency, any magazine would have been so happy to have him. But he just wanted to get back at Martha. Well, she was determined to go under the guise of interviewing nurses on a hospital ship. She talked her way onto the ship, and then she hid in the, in the ship's bathroom <laughs> until it reached Omaha Beach. On the night of June 7th, she went ashore with the ambulance crew. She mingled with them, and she worked with the stretcher bearers, wading into waist-deep water and carrying, helping to get the wounded from the shore onto the ship. And she wrote about what she saw and what she experienced, not statistics. Here you see the medics 
trying to get the wounded onto the stretcher so that they can be moved onto the ship. And she said, we lit cigarettes for them and held them for those who couldn't use their hands. We poured hot coffee through the spout of a teapot into a mouth that just showed through the bandages. She not only scooped Hemingway, but she was also the first reporter and the only woman on the scene. And her success felt somewhat sweeter when she realized that Hemingway did not manage to go ashore, even though he was on one of the invasion boats close by. After when the hospital ship returned to England, she was arrested for crossing to France without military permission. They stripped her of her credentials and they confined her to a nurse's training camp just outside London. But they told her she would return to France when the nurses were ready. Well, Martha was not happy with this arrangement and she climbed over the fence surrounding the nurses' quarters there she got a ride to a military airfield, it was the RAF, and an RAF pilot who was flying to Naples, Italy, gave her a lift. She gave him a big sob story about she had a fiancé in Italy and she needed to see him. Anyway, he gave her the ride. And in Italy, what she did, how she got around this accreditation situation, she hooked up with the French forces so the American accreditation really wasn't an issue anymore. So she charmed her way, she really did, into the mobile res regiments. Uh, she tagged along on jeeps, she slept in fields, and when she got in trouble, she lied, she cajoled, she flirted, she talked fixed. She invented boyfriends again, which she had to see one last time. Anyway, she covered the Italian campaign and was on hand when the Allies liberated Paris. Her motto was, if they don't want to accredit you, just do it. Any little lie will do. To me, all the people in the rear who make these rules, they exist just to thwart you. She followed the troops through France into Belgium, and at Arnhem, an American soldier, realizing that she had no credentials, took her to his commander, General James Gavin. Well, she charmed him too. When she told him her story, he laughed. He said she missed her Coleman. She would have made a great terrorist. <laughs> he said he'd pretend he'd never seen her. But he did see her again in Paris. And they began a two-year affair, such as they could under those circumstances. He really wanted to marry her. But she said she wasn't cut out to be a general's wife. Later on, she wrote, I was a gypsy in that war in order to report it. She was also one of the first journalists on hand after Dachau was liberated in April of 1945. There she wrote one of the most powerful pieces of the war. Her article about Dachau appeared in Collier's Weekly on June 23, 1945. She wrote of the piles and piles of naked bodies dumped like garbage, while the ragged clothing of the dead was neatly stacked. Shirts, trousers, shoes, awaiting sterilization for further use. She left nothing to the imagination because she saw that the real evil of the world lay in its failure to imagine such a hideous crime. The New York Times called her piece one of the 10 magazine's articles that shook the world. After that happened, she told friends she finally understood the true evil of man, and that it was at Dachau that she stopped being young. But no matter how hard the world was to observe, Martha continued to keep her eyes open, and she always put what she saw 
on the record, hoping that her words would help the world to open its eyes. After World War II, she continued covering conflicts all over the world. Vietnam, the 1967 Arab-Israeli conflict, the 1989 American invasion of Panama. Martha died in 1998 at the age of 89. She suffered from cancer and was almost blind. She committed suicide, choosing her own path to the end. One of her colleagues writing about her after her death said, she was a rare phenomenon. He said she was almost 90, she drank like a fish, she smoked like a chimney, and yet, you know, with her high cheekbones and her blue eyes, and well into her 80s, she could charm any man like a woman 50 years younger. So that was a really nice epitaph. I think she would have enjoyed that. <laughs> the D-Day Dames. Martha certainly served as a trailblazer for women correspondents. But her sister journalists were also just as intent on getting the story of the war. The troops had a name for them, the D-Day Dames. And the name stuck. Actually, it was said affectionately. These gals were talented journalists, and they felt a great motivation to report that they faced discrimination everywhere they looked. Nonetheless, they persevered. They pushed, they broke the rules to get the stories. It marked a turning point for women reporting from war zones. They reached the front lines eventually. They sent dispatches from Normandy. They entered newly liberated Paris in August of 1944. And later, they followed the troops into Germany and reported on the horrors of the concentration camps across Europe, just as Martha Gellhorn did. OK, most of us know Margaret Bourke White, right? She was a really famous photojournalist, famous before the war, even. She was a woman of many firsts. She was Life Magazine's first female staff photographer, and the first accredited female photographer to, com to cover the combat zones in World War II. She was absolutely fearless in pursuing the best shot. I have another film clip here, and it's a very brief overview of Martha's work during the, year, the war years and after. In 1937, Life magazine sent Margaret to Czechoslovakia and Spain to capture the rise of the Nazi party. When she returned home, she married writer Erskine Caldwell and the couple bought a home in Darien, Connecticut, where Margaret would live throughout the rest of her life, even after her divorce in 1942. Margaret's next photography assignment took her back to the Soviet Union, where she was the only foreign photographer who remained in Moscow when the first German bombs fell in 1941. She went to the embassy and went up on the roof where she was in some very real danger and photographed night after night, and she got the trajectory of the bombs that were falling. When the U.S. entered World War II, Margaret sought another overseas assignment. Her editors then arranged for her to be embedded with the U.S. Army Air Force. Margaret was the first female correspondent uh, in the war, and she was the only woman, I believe, during the entire war who went on a bombing mission. At the end of the war, Margaret traveled through Germany with General Patton and was one of the first photojournalists to document the horrors of the concentration camps as they were liberated, producing some of her most iconic photographs. She speaks in her autobiography quite openly about uh, uh, the camera kind of providing that protective layer so that she could continue with the work without being so distraught. It's an incredibly powerful series, and it was hugely influential on her life. Throughout the rest of her career, Ms. Burke White continued to take overseas assignments, often related to human rights issues.
There's Martha in her uh, flight deck uh, door in front of the plane that she went on the bombing mission with. I want to tell you just a little bit more about that bombing mission. When she was based in London, she had photographed the B-17s that flew on missions out of Britain. And she had repeatedly asked for permission to go on a combat flight, and was just as repeatedly told no. But she did manage to get assignment to cover the action in North Africa. The Air Force wouldn't let her fly there. They thought it was too dangerous. So they sent her by ship in a large convoy of nurses and troops. But her transport ship was torpedoed and sunk. Well, quite survived, along with hundreds of others, and they were packed into dangerously overcrowded lifeboats uh, eight hours before they were picked up by a destroyer. It was a truly harrowing experience, and she wrote about it. And Life magazine published the article called Women in Lifeboats. When she arrived in Africa, she again asked to go on a bombing mission. And this time, General Doolittle said yes. After all, he said, you survived being torpedoed. In the bombing raid that she went on, Martha's plane was uh, hit several times by enemy fighters, and two planes in the formation were shot down. Although her plane made it back safely to base, Doolittle's decision to let her go on that mission almost got him demoted. But her photos and the, the accompanying articles you can see there that appeared in life, it, great, it provided such great publicity that, uh, her, that his superiors let it slide. The military really loved dramatic press co coverage, but it did not love anyone, especially a woman, who avoided the regulations of the public relations office and broke rules in other ways. This photo of Bourke White was a great favorite of the American soldiers, and they used it as a pinup during the war. As the war progressed, she was attached to the US Army in Italy and later in Germany, and she repeatedly came under fire in areas of fierce fighting. This woman, who had been torpedoed, strafed by the Luftwaffe, stranded on an Arctic island, and bombed in Moscow, was known to the life of death as Maggie the Indestructible. OK. Next up, we have another photojournalist named Dickie Chappelle. Dickie always marched to the beat of a different drum. As a child, after seeing a movie about Admiral Richard Byrd's first expedition to the South Pole, she announced she wanted to be an aerial explorer. And she took the name Dickie from him. By 19, she had switched her allegiance to photography, and at 22, married her teacher, Tony Chappelle, a Navy, World War I Navy photographer, but more than twice her age. In 1943, she became accredited by the Navy as a photographer. The C on her armband there was the Miller military designation for correspondent. As far forward as you'll let me. That was Dickie Chappelle's stock answer when she was asked where she wanted to go. And more often than not, it got her further and farther than she had ever thought she could go. Like Margaret Bourke White, she was one of the founding members of the female photojournalists in World War II. The public relations officer to whom all correspondents <clears throat> reported when she asked to cover combat, that she was barred from covering combat, and besides, there were no facilities for women at the press camps. No facilities for women was the constant refrain of the military. They used it as an excuse to keep women from going anywhere near combat. But Dickie never let it stop her. 
In February of 45, she was assigned to a hospital ship, the Samaritan, to photograph the wounded as they were brought on board from Iwo Jima and to document how blood transfusions were saving lives. The carnage coming from Iwo was unimaginable. Horribly mangled bodies packed every square inch of space on the ship. Dickie tried to retain her, retain her objectivity, just like Margaret Bourke White did with the camera somehow, the a filter. She took a photo of a young Marine who was bleeding from out, he looked like he was really bleeding out from his wound. His face was ashen and it just didn't look like he was going to make it. The next day, she was busy taking pictures again and she approached another young man, a Marine to take a, another picture and he said, hey, you took my picture yesterday. Well, Chappelle didn't remember. She was sure that she had not photographed him before. But he insisted. So she said, okay, I'm going to check. She looked in her logbook, and that's where she recorded the dog tag numbers of all the wounded that she photographed. And he was right. He, she did photograph him. He was the dying young man of yesterday. But this fellow, today, was sitting up, cheerful, smiling. The difference between the dying man of yesterday and the cheerful, smiling young man of today was 14 pints of blood. Chappelle took his picture again, and her dramatic before and after pictures were used on Red Cross posters throughout the States to recruit blood donors. The pictures were so impactful that they spurred donations of rivers of blood. Excuse me, I need to take it. <laughs> On April 1st, 1945, American forces invaded Okinawa. Chappelle was with the invasion force on board another hospital ship, the Respite. She got Navy permission to go ashore to photograph the delivery of blood to the Army Field Hospital. But she was under strict orders to return to the ship by day's end. But when the pilot of the small boat took her to the island, when he dropped her, he said, I can't, I'm not going to be able to get you back today because the wind is coming up, the current's changing, and she was just stranded there. Well, two passing Marines gave her a ride to the Marine camp command post on Iwo. And when the commander saw her, he said, get that broad out of here. So the Marines took her to the Marine press camp. And that night, kamikaze attacks began. And for the next four days, kamikaze attacks, snipers, and bad weather kept Chappelle on Okinawa. Through it all, she traveled back and forth to the field hospital, when taking the pictures that she was supposed to. She didn't know it, but when she didn't return to the ship, the Navy had issued an arrest on site order for her because they thought she had drunk ship. The Marines, they knew about the order, but they ignored it because they liked Chappelle. Besides, her photos would show the Marines in action to the folks back home. On the sixth day, a Marine finally told Chappelle about the order. He told her that the original order had said, shoot on sight but was later reversed. Well, Chappelle turned herself in. She was arrested, she was evacuated from Okinawa, and taken back to Guam. There, a Marine took her at gunpoint, at gunpoint, <laughs> uh, to an airport, where he turned her over to a Navy flight nurse to ride back home with a plane load of wounded men. As he left, the Marine who was guarding her, 
he gave Nick, Dickie a big grin. And he said, well, so long, Dickie. Whatever it is, you tell him you didn't do it. Uh, and he wished her well. Well, her credentials were revoked. And although she tried to get them reinstated, she was unsuccessful. Her editor, even, wrote to the Navy. And he said, it is our considered opinion that Mrs. Chappelle, uh, the decision to reverse to uh, revoke her credentials was made largely because of her sex. But it did no good. The Dickey World War II was over. But she wasn't finished. For the next two decades, she would embed with military units around the world. She took photographs for life, for National Geographic, for Reader's Digest. And then the Vietnam War offered Dickey a second chance with the American military. Here she is in Vietnam, slogging through the water with the troops. She did five tours in Vietnam, following the Marines on their most dangerous methods, missions, excuse me. Her Vietnam photos were featured in every U.S. publication. It's not a woman's place, no question about it. There's only one other species on Earth for whom a war zone is no place, and that's men. <coughs> that's what Dickie said to Mike Wallace in a 1962 interview. A column described her as a kind of Ernie Pyle <coughs> reporter who marched with the Marines through five tours in Vietnam. It was bound to happen. Those were the last words of Dickie Chappelle. On November 4th, 1965, Chappelle was with a Marine unit on patrol near a village called Chu Lai in South Vietnam. When the Marine in front of her tripped a shell that was rigged to a grenade, Chappelle was struck in the neck by shrapnel, and she died. Photographer Henry Hewitt of the Associated Press captured this image of a Navy chaplain delivering last rites to Chappelle in the mud of a Vietnam battlefield. She was wearing combat boots, a bush hat, and her signature pearl earrings. She always wore these pearl earrings. She wanted people to know that she was a woman. <laughs> anyway, she was the first female American war correspondent to be killed in action. When I died, she said, I wanted to be on patrol with the Marines. Well, she got her wish. Here's the bush hat and the fatigues and the boots and, uh, that she wore all the time. That's where her signature costume. Chappelle loved the Marines. From the first visit to the front lines on Iwo Jima, she called them her Marines, and they responded in kind to the woman who didn't mind digging her own foxhole and ate the same chow they did. A Marine guard escorted her body home from Vietnam. On the first anniversary of her death, a monument was erected near where she was killed. The Marines who dedicated the memorial marker included these words on the plaque. She was one of us, and we will miss her. Lee Miller, another photojournalist. Lee Miller was one of four women to be accredited as a photojournalist in World War II. And she was one who had real star quality. In her early 20s, she was a top fashion model for Vogue in New York. In the pre-war 30s, she moved to Paris. And she became part of the art scene there. She became the lover, the muse, 
and uh, the, the uh, protege of Man Ray, a famous surrealist and photographer. And under his tutelage, she became a top-notch photographer. Soon after, she moved to London and got a job as a photographer for the British edition of Vogue. And she started to pho photograph the Blitz, what was happening during the Blitz, in, excuse me, in London. She wanted to document the terrible devastation that were caused by the Nazi bombings. In 1942, she became accredited by the U.S. Army. But she, like the other women correspondents, was not accredited to combat. As a result, Miller began photographing women in their many war roles, like the, women, the nurses, the, uh, the women who served in the auxiliary service, like the uh, women of the Royal Navy Service, etc. The Imperial War Museum in Kew, just outside London, they exhibit many of her photographs of these women. I'm just going to show you a couple here. Notable among them is this shot of a French woman accused of collaborating with the Germans. Sleeping with the enemy was called horizontal collaboration. Here she is being interrogated before being publicly shamed as a collaborator. For Miller, hair was important. In this photo, you can see that woman's shame is almost palpable. Miller showed empathy and understanding. But this, to me, is low-hanging fruit. You know, that was easy. At that time of the war in France, you know, all of the men, able-bodied men, had been rounded up conscripted, sent to Germany to work in the munitions plant for slave laborers. Those who escaped that went to the hills. They joined the resistance. They were called the Maquis. So what was left in Paris was women and children, and old men, and old people. And they were starving, because every resource that France had went to Germany. So. People did what they could to eat for women to take care of their children. And for some, okay, to take, you know, so that they could maybe live a better life than they were living. So what? The real collaborators, the real collaborators, the businessmen who worked and, and made money with the Germans, they got away with it. They, then they prospered, and they went on after the war. And some of them had very highly held positions after the war. But when I saw these pictures, it just uh, put a little dagger in my heart. <laughs> anyway, but some of Miller's most vivid reporting was in St. Malo, France, in August of 44, where she had been told that the fighting was over. But when she got there, it wasn't. And although she wasn't credited to, to combat, she wasn't about to leave. She said, I had the clothes I was standing in, a couple of dozen rolls of film, and a, uh, a, a down uh, sleeping bag. Anyway, she was able to take pictures of the action, soldiers shooting, soldiers, excuse me, uh, hiding out from the bombing, whatever. She took the pictures, and she also took a picture of the German surrender because the Allies vanquished the Germans in St. Malo. So that's a picture of their surrender. Well, the editors at Vogue were just thrilled with her photographs and the text. The Public Relations Office, however, was not. The Public Relations Officer had her placed under her house arrest for violating the terms of her accreditation. The first day of her confinement, Miller typed like crazy. The second day she slept, and the third day she took off because the Allied forces were pushing the Germans out of France, and Paris was about to be liberated, and Miller was going to be there when it happened. She said, I won't be the first journalist in Paris. She wrote this to her editor. But I'll be the first Dane photographer unless somebody parachutes in. 
the determination and the reporting of Lee Miller and her sister rule breakers ultimately learned them, earned them permission to get closer to the action <coughs> starting in September of 44. This was after the fall of Paris. This is Miller's most iconic photograph. With her colleague, David Sherman, it was taken at Hitler's cottage in Munich, Germany, just hours after she had visited the concentration camp at Dachau. Miller's boots were covered with the mud and the ashes from the concentration camp. And you can see them right there on the, on the bath mat. Next to a portrait of Hitler, she sits in the tub and she washes herself. She strikes back at Hitler in her own way, crossing a personal boundary in order to express her hatred of the dictator. Unbeknownst to her, that very day, Hitler and Eva Braun had committed suicide. There's much more to uh, Miller's story, but uh, you know, time constraints don't permit me to go, but it's a very interesting story. After the war, she never told anybody about what she had done. Her son didn't know it until his wife found boxes, after her death, found boxes of her films, of her pictures, some 20,000. And now they're on display at the Imperial War Museum. But, and she, she ended up, she had a drinking problem, she had PTSD. You know, a lot of these people have PTSD. You see things like that and you don't get over it. Anyway, moving on. Okay, Marguerite Higgins. Based in Paris, Higgins was a pushy American reporter for the Herald Tribune. She was very pretty and a talented linguist. I think she could speak, speak four or five languages. She was also a really hard driving reporter who repeatedly risked her life for a good story. And she aroused more male reporter animosity <laughs> than any other woman, woman journalist. In April of 45, Higgins teamed up with Sergeant Peter First. He was a correspondent for the Stars and Stripes, and he had a jeep, and they headed the Dachau concentration camp after they heard that American troops were about to liberate it. When they arrived, they learned that fighting was going on. I'm sorry. They, they learned that fighting was going on on the northern outskirts of the camp. But some Germans told them white flags had been seen at the south end. Detouring around the fighting, Higgins and her driver first headed for the southern end. Just short of the watchtower, first stopped the jeep. Higgins got out, and then she looked up at the watchtower, and she said it was crammed with SS men with guns. Rifles were at the ready, and there was a machine gun trained on her. Though she had no idea, she said, what prompted her, she ignored her driver's motions to, you know, sit down, play dead. <laughs> Instead, she got out of the Jeep and she shouted up to the guard if she could speak German. I don't know if I'm going to do this correctly, but she shouted up, Come and see here, bitte. We are sitting American which means, come here, please. We are Americans. 22 guards came down and surrendered to her. <laughs> First, put the SS officer on the hood of the jeep. <laughs> uh, handed Higgins a cop pistol, and they drove to the prisoner's area. When they got there, and the prisoners realized that they were Americans, they went wild. She said, I had never seen such joy and pandemonium. For a half hour, the pregnants tried to carry Higgins and first around. They, both of them, Higgins, they got badly bruised in all of this chaos. But when the American troops arrived a little later, 
a general grabbed her and he dragged her, he kind of dragged her out of the enclosure. And he said, what the hell are you doing in there? You don't you know there's typhus raging in here? And he shook her so hard that he took her breath away. And she said, you let me go. What the hell are you doing? I'm just doing my job and I've had a typhus shot. <laughs> well, that same general later on recommended her for the army campaign with her, which she did receive. Well, she went on to report on the liberation of Buchenwald, and then ignoring army regulations, she went through the Soviet zone of Germany into Poland, where she reported on the civil war between Polish patriots and communists. She remained in Germany for five years and was one of the many women reporters to cover the Nuremberg trials of the Nazi war criminals. And then she went on to cover the Korean War. When the press officer tried to deter her again with the old saw, there were no facilities for, uh, for women there. She said, no problem. Plenty of bushes in Korea. <laughs> well, I have a few minutes left. Um, I want to go on to, this is the Middle East. I don't know how many of you have heard of Marie Colvin. Yeah, OK. So you know her story. She was an American journalist, but she worked for the Sunday Times of London as their Middle East correspondent. She reported, just like uh, Martha Gilhorn, she reported on the effects of war on the civilian populations. She repeatedly placed herself in harm's way to bring the stories of these people to the world. She said, these are people who have no voice. She wrote of the importance of telling people about the humanity, about humanity in extremis, pushed to the unendurable. She said, my job is to bear witness. I have never been interested in knowing what make of plane had bombed what village, or whether the artillery they fired was 120 millimeter or 155 millimeter. She shared the same ethos as her hero, Martha Gellman. In fact, I think as she said in the clip earlier, she carried around Martha Gellman's book in the face of war wherever she traveled. She was not interested in politics, strategy, weaponry, only the effects of the people she regarded as innocents. These are the people with no voice. I have a moral responsibility toward them. When people called her fearless, she said, bravery is not being afraid to be afraid. She, con she covered conflicts wherever they broke out, Balkans, Czech Chechnya, and Zimbabwe. But particularly, she was knowledgeable about the Arab countries. I'm going to try and wind up quickly here now. In 1999, East Timor was fighting for independence from Indonesia. Colvin stationed herself inside of a UN compound alongside 1,500 refugees, all of them women and children. They were being besieged by the Indonesian militia, threatening to blow the building to pieces. Journalists and UN staff, they had abandoned the city. When she told her editor that only she and two female Dutch journalists had stayed behind to help the stranded refugees. He asked, where are all the men gone? She said, they don't make men like they used to. <laughs> that line became part of her legend. <laughs> she continued reporting to let the world know what was happening. You know, they had the uh, satellite phone. It paid off. The refugees were evacuated, and a thousand, over a thousand people lived to see another day. Her courage made her a force to be reckoned with. In 2001, she went on assignment in Sri Lanka in the midst of their civil war. She reported from inside the territory uh, controlled by the Tamil rebels. She wanted to show that the civilians, was, they were being starved out 
by the, by the Indonesian uh, militia. But on April 16, she paid a big price for her bravery. She, she was sneaking through a, a cashew plantation with the Tamil Tigers, <coughs> and the field just lit up with flares. And she was, you know, they were strafing and shooting, and a bomb went off near her. And it hit her eye and her lung, punctured her lung and destroyed that left eye. She survived, but she would have to wear an ear, ear patch, an uh, eye patch, for the rest of her life. She was left with scars, though, that cut deeper than skin. She had PTSD. She said, I know things that I don't want to know, like how small a body gets when it is burned to death. The people of East Timor, the ones that she had helped out in the compound, they didn't forget their savior. At the end of the piece that she wrote for the uh, Sunday Times report, she wrote, what I want most, as soon as I get out of hospital, is a vodka martini and a cigarette. Later that week, having moved briefly to a New York hotel, she was awakened. Room service came knocking at her door, and they had a tray with a huge bottle of vodka and all the ingredients for her drink of choice. She discovered that it had been fixed. She said, God knows how by the East Timor crowd, the people in the compound. They had read her story. OK, I'm wrapping up, Penny. No, it's OK. It's OK. Not okay. right. OK. The Wire tells the story of Marie Colvin, one of this country's most respected war correspondents. Oh, my god. She came to die of what many say was a deliberate attack on international journalists by the Assad regime. I want to tell the stories of each person. In 2012, in the early stages of Syria's civil war, Marie and photojournalist Paul Conroy stayed to cover the siege of Homs by the Assad regime. As civilians and rebels were indiscriminately shelled, the media center housing them and other journalists was, eyewitnesses say, specifically and methodically targeted. Paul Conroy, who survived the attack, spoke to me before the film screening in London tonight. We'd just gone into the main room in the media center, and I had two huge explosions about 100 meters either side. And I was like, Phew. And about less than a minute later, two more huge explosions, 50 meters. And at that point, I knew that this was quite precise location. And they were bracketing and walking the shells onto our building. Um, and a minute after that, they, we took four direct hits on the building. Dozens of Syrians were killed that day, and Marie Colvin, along with a French colleague, both of whom had made a conscious decision to stay in Homs to bear witness to what was happening to trapped civilians, died. And this is a report of her death. Marie Colvin of the United States worked as a foreign correspondent for London Sunday Times. She and French war photographer Remy Olchel were in the western city of Homs when rockets fired by the government forces hit the house where they and other journalists were staying. Shannon Anderson Cooper spoke with Marie Colvin just hours before she died. Here's how she described the situation in Homs. This is the worst, Anderson, um, for many reasons. Um, the last one, I mean, I think it's the last time we talked when I was in the drunk, so. Um, it, it's partly a personal thing, I guess. Um, there's nowhere to run. The Syrian army is, is, is holding the perimeter, and there's just far more ordnance being poured into the city, and, and no way of predicting where it's going to land. Anderson Cooper joins us live now, and Anderson, listening to that conversation from last night, we were watching here during the program last night and leaning forward to listen to her urgent report because she's so good. Uh, it has to be tough to listen to that now, knowing what happened overnight. Uh, yeah, it's really shocking. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, her voice just hearing again was always so cool under fire. And even though she had been to so many conflicts and so many front lines, she never lost her, her humanity and her ability to see with, with, with you know, with, with a, a new way of seeing it and, and to bring that humanity to all of us. And I think that's what made her, her so remarkable. She was, I mean, she was such a brave, such a good reporter, but so very human even in the midst of all this inhumanity. 
and I think her experience is important. You mentioned it. She kept her cool. She was always calm. Uh, she liked to go where the action was and expose the outrage, if you will. Listen to this part of your conversation where she is talking about the Syrian tactics. It's a complete and utter lie that they are only going after terrorists. There are rockets, shell, tank shells, um, and the aircraft being fired in a parallel line into the city. The Syrian army is simply shelling the city of cold, starving civilians. Marie Colvin, um, I know it's impossible to stay safe, but, but please try. Thank you for talking to us. Thanks very much, Anderson. Anderson, two things about that, uh, that snippet there just jump out at you. One is sort of direct and straightforward, telling it like it is reporting, essentially saying what the Syrian government is telling you is a lie. And then at the end there, forgive me, my friend, it has to be an eerie. Uh, if you did the right thing, stay, stay safe. But then when you listen to that today, it gives you a bit of a chill. Yeah, I mean, uh, she used the word lie, which a lot of people don't use. And, and I think um, a lot of people, certainly in Syria and around the world, uh, appreciate the fact that Marie Colvin was willing to use that word when she saw a lie. And, and that's what she's seen. Uh, day after day in Syria, the, the regime is lying about what is happening there, lying about what they're doing there, the, the atrocities they're committing there. Um, yeah, and certainly at the end, I mean, you know, you always sound like an idiot when you're safe here and on the state side and saying to someone in a war zone, you know, stay safe. You know they can't, and, and she knows you can't. But, um, you know, she chose to go e even though she knew she wouldn't, there was no place to stay safe. And, and, and Palm's unlike so many other places, there's no place you can escape to. They're, they're, they're surrounded, uh, and anywhere, anywhere, anybody there can, can get killed. And, you know, one of the things, Sean, people keep saying she's fearless. And I think, I don't think that gives her enough credit. I, I think she, like many people who report from war zones, I think she felt fear, but she never allowed fear to stop her from going. And I think that's what makes her heroic, and that's what made her so brave. A very important point you make there, important perspective at the end. We mourn our two fallen comrades, and we also salute the great journalists at CNN and our news organizations who continue the reporting in such terrible and dangerous conditions. Mr. Cooper, thank you. Okay, just summing up. Today we've talked about a really small number of the very many remarkable women who covered World War II and beyond. All of their stories are compelling. I'm struck by how gutsy, determined, and tough they were. All of them offered a new optic to war. Most of them, from Martha Gellhorn to Lee Miller, responded to the suffering and the loss experienced, not just by those who did the actual fighting, but also by those who did the enduring and had nowhere to run. Martha Gellhorn felt if she could write about the suffering in such a way that those who had not experienced it could actually imagine it, perhaps that could put an end to war. On the other hand, Marguerite Higgins, she wrote hard-edged tactical pieces, pitting herself against her male colleagues and calling herself not a newswoman, she called herself a newsman. They brought new and varied sensibilities to witnessing war, and they put their lives on the line to report it. Moreover, these brave reporters and dozens like them formed a crucial link in the long chain of women's struggle for full, full equality in a profession dominated by men. Thank you for listening.